So we're talking about puck handling. We want to talk about passing qualities. And the three passing qualities are pass it hard, flat, and on the tape. So when we're getting a pass, the reason why we want to be good at doing this is it helps get the puck out of your zone. So when you're passing the puck, you pass it to the guy hard, flat, right on the ice. Now the problem is, if you give it to him soft, he's got a puck protect, and then there's going to be a fight, and it's likely not going to get out of the zone. So by you passing the puck back to your teammate as hard as you can, he gets it early, and he can get the puck out of his zone. And if it's a really hard pass, the player can wing it so it's up off the glass by tipping his stick. Here, Josh is going to give me a saucer pass. And we use that if there's a four checker. So for instance, if he comes in and holds your stick out, come on, go get him. He's going to saucer it over your stick. But the thing is, every time you sauce it, it makes the puck tend to want to bounce and it's risky that he could probably flag it down. So we only use sauce in an emergency situation. So watch this again, sauce pass. Four checker comes in, up and over his stick. It's a safe play, but it sometimes complicates it. So let's put our goalie goose in. So as a young goalie, it's important for us to learn puck handling even at a young age. So it's like learning a language. It becomes natural and simple. So let's see how Goose does in a couple saucer passes. So come on in, go four check him. Goose is gonna go get it. Lift it up and over his stick if you can. Nice. And right on my tape, that's an exceptional pass. Let's watch a couple more. When you got a strong four checker, here's where you're gonna use the sauce and get it up and over his stick. And let's do that one more time, Goose. Try to bring it right off the heel of your stick, Goose. So start it on your heel and spin through the puck like that, okay? One more time, here we go. Nice. And that's gonna help get the puck out of the zone. Okay, when we go to a new building, one thing that's important is to know the boards and to read the boards. And that's important because every arena is different. For instance, when we dump pucks around this board, we wanna know if there's any little messes up with the board. Normally at a Zamboni door it happens. Sometimes when you dump pucks up around on the glass, they come out in front. So every warm-up that you guys play, you should do some test dumps. So in the warm-up at every game, have one of your good players take a couple pucks to test the boards. See how bouncy they are. See how quickly that puck comes out to danger. We also wanna see how do pucks manage themselves around when we rim it. See if there's any goofy bounces. All right, Josh, when we're passing the puck to a teammate, we want to maintain possession. And depending on the type of pressure you have will depend on what type of pass you use. Now, you can use a direct pass, you can use an indirect pass, and you can also use a rim pass. And there's a hierarchy. We want to try to do them in that priority if we can. Wherever possible, direct pass from your stick to his stick. If you have time issues because of a four checker, you may have to use an indirect and we'll talk about that one, as well as rims. So the best type of pass you can give a teammate is directly from your stick to his stick. A couple more like that. Direct. A couple more. Perfect, last one. All right. And sometimes if we got four check pressure, you're gonna have to use an indirect. And so basically when we do indirects, we don't use the white boards because it's an inconsistent bounce. We use the yellow dasher because we can trust its bounce. So in a four checker, you use the yellow, give him a nice pass. Here we go. And by using an indirect, it buys us a little more time. So if we don't have time to do a direct, we use an indirect. And the final type of pass is the rim. And we never want to use a rim pass. So go right on the hash marks like your winger. And we try to avoid this at all costs because when you do a rim pass to a guy, he's got to fight it out of his feet or he's got to turn around. And when a four checker comes to get him, it's going to be a problem. So on this one, let's have you start at the top of the circle, maybe like a little bit higher, like your defenseman. And I want you to pretend pinch down to kill your brother. The one risk to doing a rim pass 
is the puck gets in your feet and you put your winger in a bad spot. He could get pinched down on. Now, if he were to give him a direct pass, it would have been a much easier zone exit. So to review, let's make sure wherever possible we go direct pass. If the direct pass isn't there because of forecheck pressure, we're gonna go with an indirect pass. And worst case Ontario, the rim, because you give your winger a hand grenade. And the final point when we're talking about this puck handling, puck handling, is we gotta make sure when pucks are dumped up on the glass, that we stay in the net because we don't want to be behind the net waiting for a puck that's coming on the glass to try to stop it here where it's going to come out in front. Hey Mazda, what's going on? Good to have you it's here in that beautiful Lambton Shores. Yeah. So, how long ago did we meet? How did we even hook up? Was it on the old goalie store bulletin board or where did that all start? Yeah, I, uh, I think I did some little artwork for you for the side of your truck. Nice. And uh, you were kind enough to repay me with a private session and that was the first uh, real experience I had with a professional goalie coach. It was nine years ago. Wow, time and, flies. Uh, Thank God I'm getting better looking. <laughs> um, yeah, I do that a lot where I barter you know, for people that are experts in different things to help me out with some of the stuff I do. And the only thing I can really do is teach kids and adults how to play hockey so I think that that brings back memories of how we would have got started so I call you Mazda what's your official name Mazda Mazda yeah Mazda Mazda and you play at Toronto and you're playing in rec league there yeah I'm a rent a goalie by trade oh nice and yeah. that's not a bad way to make some money on the side it's better than deliver newspapers or something like that you get to stop pucks and get paid for it or you just get free ice uh, I mean, it's both, right? It's uh, it's a way to help cover the gas and some of the equipment expenses sometimes. Um, you know, I have my full-time job as a graphic designer, obviously, so I try to play as much as I can while I while I still have the hips for it. So how many nights a week would you be playing in Toronto? Ideally, uh, I would say four or five times a week. Right, and so with that uh, booking service, is it an online thing where people can go and say, I want Mazda, and they can pick the goalie they want, or they just want a goalie to show up to make sure they're not shooting at an empty net? Yeah, so I'm affiliated with a service called MyPuck. I've been with him for, his name is Patrick Herman, the guy who runs it. Great guy, awesome guy. Um, he, I've known him for probably about 10 years now. And uh, so usually the thing with rent -a goalie is if you play well, if the team likes you, you know, they end up asking for you personally next time out. So it's a great way to, you know, make new relationships and friendships. Right, and you know, the people you meet in different professions there would be an amazing thing as well. You know, we talked in an earlier video this season about beer league goalies and how you can sort of ingratiate yourself to your teammates. And when you're a rental goalie and you're coming in, a bunch of new guys you don't know, they don't want somebody to be the hacky wacky, stick banger, screaming, you know, being a drama queen like Bennington. Um, <laughs> by the way, I saw Bennington last night swinging his stick around being Bennington. What are your, what are your thoughts on that and how would that play in beer league? I can't stand it. I think in beer league, everyone would be looking at him like he's the biggest idiot on the ice. So I don't know why you would conduct yourself as a professional that way. And I've, I've seen that from him on several occasions. And, um, you know, I know from playing pro hockey, your teammates on your own team don't like it because they're going to have to answer the bell for him. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody comes to give it to him for, you know, barking and beaking, like he, he reminds me of a little uh, small dog that's a chihuahua that chirps at everybody. But, you know, when the big dogs show up, he's not going to do anything. No, that's why he's always hiding behind his teammates. So maybe that's his nickname, Bennington the Chihuahua. <laughs> I call him Winnington. Winnington, that's, a, that's another good one. So, you know, back to your journey in hockey, um, we always, every one of us, we're all goalies, we're all the same. Doesn't matter how high we play or how low or wherever we are, we're all goalies, we're in the same union. And we all have similar stories. And I, I'd be curious to know, what was the first little spark, that, the catalyst that get you to want to become a goalie in the first place? What triggered that? Um, growing up, my brother and I, we, um, we, were, we were born and raised in Finland, and our favorite team was Tampere Ilves. And uh, the goalie at the time was Vesa Toskala. And he was an awesome little guy, um, you know, made the most acrobatic saves you could think of. Yeah. I remember watching him and being like, you know, there's something to that. And then I also remember Ari Sulander, he was another national team hero. Dominic Kashuk in the 98 Olympics, um, that, was, that was the point where I was like, that's what I want to do. Uh, so I used to play road hockey with my friends, and I would just, you know, flop around in front of a, in, uh, in, in on concrete, you know, and just uh, play as much as I could. Yeah, year round, you know, it was icy outside or 
or a nice summer day. Yeah. So I had Vesa when he was playing for Toronto and he had a little pot belly on him and great kid, super coachable. And normally the Finns and the Swedes uh, are super for accepting coaching. And you know, the Finnish goalies, uh, I drafted to Karask before they traded him away on me. So I love the Finnish goalies. And the thing with them is they're very good with their gloves. And they used to have a little bit of a tick where they would come across the shoulder and ask Vesa, why before the guy shoots are you moving your glove over there? And he said it came from a game like baseball they play in Finland. So you could tell me what that game is and how that might impact a goalie's ability to be such a great catcher of the puck, like the Kiprasovs, like the Toskos, uh, like the Tukaras. Finnish goalies are well known for having amazing glove hand. What's that game and what, what's it like? Uh, it's called Pesapallo. Yeah. And it's like, a, it's like a faster, more athletic version of baseball. Right. Um, I personally never played it at like a, other than um, you know gym class in school. But uh, it's crazy. It's got really weird rules, and uh, there's a lot of you know running and catching involved. Um, a little bit more active uh, than than baseball. So a lot of kids growing up play that, and I think that's what helps them uh, you know cultivate those great glove skills. Yeah, they're amazing glove skills. And the other thing that I've always loved about Finland is they've got a great model for goaltending development for the kids all the way up to adults. And um, we've studied that at the NHL level. It's actually crying shame we don't have that type of consistency of instruction in the United States and Canada. Um, the one thing I talked to Vesa about was that exact topic. And Toskala said that they had a, a goalie coach all teaching the same curriculum. It wasn't ego driven about this is the way McKeegan teaches or this is the way Eli Wilson teaches. It was a generalized curriculum. And they had a quality goalie coach that stayed with them through all the levels all the way up through minor hockey. And it does make sense by extension that there'd be a lot of those guys end up making the NHL. Now you didn't have a traditional path and play minor hockey in Finland. How did you get from playing out on the street to now being a, a goalie that's busy five nights a week playing in Toronto? Uh, when we moved to Toronto I was 10 and uh, my parents put me into like house league hockey and uh, growing up I was a forward because I uh, we couldn't afford the goalie equipment or the training or anything um, so I just I bounced around in house league as a forward for a few years ended up quitting hockey um, when I was in high school because um, I always wanted to be a goalie and I didn't have that opportunity so unfortunately I chose to quit uh, instead of you know trying to keep fighting through it yeah. um, so it took me until I was about 20 years old until I um, started to try buying you know secondhand gear off friends and um, getting back out on the ice with uh, you know shinny groups that I knew and um, and that's basically how I got here and it's um, just been practicing every day as much as I can. Yeah. So it's nice for kids today, we have access to stuff like YouTube channels um, and the internet. That's changed in a lot of ways how kids can learn and consume information about being a goalie if they don't have an NHL goalie coach there. And that's one of the key reasons why, you know, you've known my history for 30 years of putting all my drills, all the knowledge I have that I've gotten from other people out there. So how would you say you've learned, you know, besides that initial lesson we did, how have you grown your game? How do you correct? What are some ways that you can become a better adult goalie when you don't have an NHL goalie coach working with you seven times a week doing stuff like we're going to do today? I think the best attitude to have is to be an open book. Um, try to see seek out as many um, you know professionals as you can and just and just learn from each and every one of them. Um, you know, I I personally. Um, you know, like about 10 years ago, there wasn't really that much of a social media presence, like the, the breadth of information that we have now. Um, but then over the years when I started seeing, you know, for example, you were putting out so much content in the early days um, and just having access to other goalie coach cha channels and seeing drills and, and trying to replicate them on the ice. I think that's, um, that's been one of the biggest, biggest um, you know, uh, helpful tools out there. So you train with a, a girl named Carly Richardson, and what's her hockey school's name in Toronto? Uh, Own the Zone Goaltending. Own the Zone Goaltending. And she does great stuff. I see online, she's got great drills. She's a, a super student of the game, and I'm a big fan of what she does up in Toronto. And so if any of you guys want to get trained by a great goalie coach, Carly Richardson at... Own the Zone Goaltending. Own the Zone Goaltending would be a great place to look into if you want to get some coaching in Toronto. And you don't feel like driving up here to the lake to work with the GOAT. So, who right now is your favorite goalie in the NHL? Uh, I, I still have to go with Rask and Rene, and it's tough because they're both, you know, Rene is, is gone now and Rask, um, we don't know if he'll be back. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Yusuf Saros, 
Uh, he's only five foot ten, I think, and uh, as a smaller guy myself, I really look up to him. He's just a phenomenal athlete and always competes so so hard and um, outplays guys, you know, many many inches taller than him. And I love UC Saros, and I love the fact that he plays the the proper depth and aggressive style to match his height. And I think that's a good takeaway for younger goalies. You can't control how tall you're going to be, how short you're going to be, but you can control your position and you can control stopping and controlling the puck. So, you know, as much as the NHL is leaning towards big goalies, we don't need to worry about that. You just need to worry about the next puck and how you can play the best with the tools that you have. And it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Tuka Rask and not a lot of people know the story behind the big drama in Toronto, how he got sent to Boston for Andrew Raycroft. And, so I was involved in drafting Tuka Rask. Love him, big kid, super kid. Saw him playing the World Juniors where he basically was the best goalie there. And another kid we drafted the same timeline was Justin Pogge. So I had both Pogge and Rask as goalies. I was looking forward to growing and developing. And then we we're gonna put them both in the Marlies and the minor league team. And their agent said, at no way are both of them gonna to wanna to play there at the same time. If one signs, the other's not gonna sign. So effectively, we're gonna lose an asset. And and I'd said in the meetings, you know, there's so many great Finnish goalies in the NHL. I wouldn't be moving on from a Finnish goalie. Yeah, I get the kids, a Toronto or a Canadian kid, Pogi, one of World Juniors, and you know, Don Cherry, rah rah rah, Canada, Canada. But I said the goalie that's likely going to come above this is going to be Tuukka Rask. And so fast forward to the next week, I was coaching Andrew Raycroft. <laughs> so, what do you like about Tuukka Rask's game? Uh, I like his calm demeanor. Um, I like that. I mean, you know, saying that, you know, we've, we've seen a few tantrums from him in the I early. I was just going to say, I've seen a couple <laughs> sticks break, a couple puck buckets being thrown on the ice, but he's fiery for sure. Yeah, uh, I love his passion for sure. Um, but he also, you know, the difference between that kind of passion versus what you see from Bennington, for example, Rask doesn't, um, you know, start with, you know, players from other teams. He, uh, he gets upset when he doesn't play well. Right. And I think that's what you want to see. I think that you want to see that kind of accountability from your goalie. Right. Um, he doesn't throw his own teammates under the bus. He's always, you know, you know, he's brutally honest. You know, if he, if he doesn't play well, he's the first to admit it. And I feel like he's taken so much flack out in Boston from his own fans as well. Um, but, you know, he's, he's always brought it almost every night. I think there's a great teachable moment in there as we wrap this up related to the honest showing of emotion. And I would equate it to a head coach. So you know the Tortorellas that are always screaming, always in your face, always having outbursts. That is a very short shelf life. And it's the same thing with the goaltender. Once in a while you're going to get upset with the circumstance, whatever, stick bang and you know get a little upset like that. But if it's a consistent always, that's what it's going to be then you see the problem. The, the people don't play for Tortorella over time because that wanes. And when your teammates see you losing your stuff all the time, every game, every goal, it gets old. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, like, like he's not like that. He's got a good emotional control. Once in a while it comes out, but it's, it bubbles. But it's not something where he's always snapping. And I think that's a good takeaway for goalies, whether you're playing for a living or whether you're playing for beer league, you know, you're gonna get upset. You're gonna show emotions, we're humans. But we got to manage it, and if it's done in selected ways, at, at various select times, it's going to be fine. I just wouldn't want to see little kids every game they get scored on bang and black and sticks. And at the NHL level, when we scout, emotional intelligence and emotional control is one of the key things on our list because over an 82-game season, it has to be there. And I love Tuca. Um, you know, he's accomplished great things. I never would have projected him to do what he's done. But, you know, you can never take away Stanley Cup ring. And, you know, he's got a lot of the records with the Boston Bruins. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to the new Bruins goalie. Have you seen the Jeremy Swayman kid play? Yeah, he's, he's been really good. He started off pretty well last year. He had a, a little uh, look-see, did well there. He had an off game the other night. But, again, the one takeaway with him, he's a super character kid and so is his family. And I think there's another message there for the young kids that you have to understand people are looking for character, especially in today's world. They want character, they want accountability, they want professionalism. And I think that's one thing I've always loved working with you, Mazda, because you have that. You have the character and the professionalism. And uh, let's get out on the ice today and see if I can beat the crap out of you in the three-puck game. Sounds good. All right, see you.